Welcome to the Story in Your Head podcast. I'm Ron Macklin, and today we have uh, Deb Dendy and a special guest, Dr. Bowen White. Uh, Bowen, could you give us just a brief introduction of yourself, and then we'll get started. A brief introduction. Well, I am a high-powered medical professional person, um, a father, a grandfather. I'm a boy named Sue. That's Sue Chef to my wife, Kim, who is the chef. I'm laundry boy. Um, I, I'm the lawn boy. Um, and I uh, am I'm good with uh, low-skill labor. Thank nice. You, thank, thank you, Bowen. So I want to uh, add a little bit into that. Um, over 25 years ago, I met Bowen for the very first time. I was uh, 31 years of age. I was in a room with a bunch of executives, and I was scared to death because I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I belonged inside there. And inside that room, I was expecting a Dr. Bowen White to walk in, and what walked in was um, not Bowen White. It was a, a, a lab coat, right, a, and red nose, and a clown. And I had wondered whether I was still in the right room because I wasn't sure what, what the guy was going to talk about. And then he started to talk about stuff that was, or the executives that were in the room. And the thing that stood out to me was he started talking about fear. Mm -hmm. He's talking about being scared. And I, for the life of me, thought he was just talking to me. I had the story that he was going to point me out at any moment now that I was the scared guy in the room <laughs> and everybody else was confident and all this, because they were. They looked to me the way to me. And then he said, how many of you in this room are afraid and you think there's something wrong with you that you're afraid? Because I was sitting in front of the room, you know, I, I was going to fill up. Whatever he's going to say, I'm, I'm going to get it all, right, because I'm right there close. And I just very cautiously start to raise my hand, go trying to, every courage I had and he begins to point at me, but he wasn't me. It was just my story that he was pointing at me. And he starts to say, and he points around the room and says, look around. And every person in that room had their hand up. And the stories in my head changed that moment. I went from, I'm afraid and there's something wrong with me, to I'm afraid and I'm normal. So here it is, 27 years later, Bowen. My first question for you is, what, what, like, how did you discover this space where you decided it was a place to share that story about fear and, and the scared self, scared guy, uh, scared one, and, and to do it in front of a group of executives? Like, what was your, how did you get there? What brought you to that space? Well, I'd been, you know, working with groups of people since. 1983, actually 1982, when I started doing group work in my residency in family medicine. Um, and I started, I had written a column for the Kansas City Business Journal from like 83 to 85. And the column was called Patient Potential. And one of the things that I was doing also was I had started a Department of Preventive and Stress Medicine and was doing a wellness um, program for the hospital. And, you know, I was doing a medical spot on, on TV once a week for the CBS affiliate in Kansas City. I did that from 83 to 90. And um, one of the, the things that you do when you're interested in stress, uh, fear is the driver of the stress response. Um, and the stress response is a survival response. And I noticed that a lot of what stresses people, they, they stress themselves. I mean, you hear people say it all the time. Yeah, I'm my own worst enemy. And we are, we, we grow up sharing something in common. And the thing that we share in common and the thing that I noticed was that we get more specific negative feedback than specific positive feedback on the road to learning how to do grown up. And it starts in a family system in which knowing all of our family systems are different. The thing that we share in common, regardless of the family system, is there's only one way of doing things. That's the 
right way. Right way. If you can't do it right, don't you're do it wrong. <laughs> and, and and if you really want it done right, do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> So when we started, and I look at life as a movie, when we started the movie of our lives, did we know the right way to do anything? I mean, I know. everybody yeah. listening, you know, we, we all pooped in our pants. I mean, we all peed on people. We, we had to learn the social amenities and how, what's the final common pathway of learning? Is it trial and success or trial and error? So why do we need repetition, repetition, repetition when we're learning things? Because we have to fail enough to earn the right to have met performance criteria for doing it the right way. So getting more specific negative feedback than specific positive feedback on the road to learning everything, um, we all got our feelings of inadequacy reinforced. Mm. And people that loved us, cared about us, taught us, coached us. Um, nobody talked about this secret. The secret that we share is that we all have these feelings of inadequacy that never go away. And one of the things that we learn how to do as a child is to compensate for those feelings of inadequacy at a very early age by showing that we can do stuff like a two or three year olds trying to do something and you go to help them. And they look up at you and they go, I'd rather do it myself. Yeah. We learn at a very early age. We don't need help. We could do it ourselves. And from that point on, we get reinforced by not needing any help. By being able to do things alone and by ourselves. And we just happen to live in a culture. It's very individualistic. People are supposed to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. So it fits nicely into the acculturation process. Um, and Carl Jung said it, we act out on the world stage what's unresolved within the psyche. To compensate for my feelings of inadequacy, how do I want to be perceived by other people? Yeah, confident, articulate. You know, you only have one chance to make a first impression. Don't make a mistake. Don't misspeak yourself. So we have a bias. And the bias is against <laughs> talking about what we all share in common. And that's this secret that we all have feelings of inadequacy we don't want anyone to know about. And we compensate by showing the world how competent and successful and on top of our game we are. And the thing is, that means we're projecting images that we want other people to see and what's unrevealed is the authentic self. So what happens is we, we don't risk being vulnerable by sharing mistakes that we make because then we might, somebody might know our secret. <laughs> that we all have a scared guy that I call this part of us, the scared one, scared guy, scared gal. We all have one, everyone has one and he or she never goes away. It's connected to our ego and it's the driver of ambition to demonstrate we can do it ourselves. And it's so sad because, well, I had a girlfriend in high school and I just saw her recently. We talked about this. We had a I, ninth grade, you know, I thought she was great, you know, and was, you know, we had a hot, intense relationship, you know, we would slow dance and suck face. I mean, it was intense. And on my birthday in ninth grade, she gave me a birthday card and I opened the card and looked at it. And I had no choice but to break up with her. What do you think the card said? Well, my speculations is something to do with love. Uh, I, I love, love you. you. Yeah. Yeah. And I had no choice but to break up with her. Virginia Satir said it. When you feel as if you have no choice but to do X, your self-esteem is in the tank. Mm -hmm. I couldn't 
risk letting her know my secret. I couldn't let her risk really getting close because if she knew, then she could blow my cover and then everyone would know. So to stay safe, which is the motto of the scared guy, safety and security at all costs. And the scared guy's driven by the fear that at any moment we could be exposed as inadequate. Fear is a driver of the stress response. It's a survival response. So you can survive your whole life with the accoutrements of wealth and not live your life fully. Bowen, you, you said something about it drives ambition. Could, yeah. could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, how do we demonstrate to the world that we belong, that we're adequate, competent, successful? It's through achievement. All right. And so we have a culture that encourages workaholism because, you know, staying at the office and showing everybody else that you really care. I mean, we connect that to really caring about wanting to do a good job. And so, but it's never enough, see, because the scared one never goes away. Um, so if we allow that part of us to run our lives without awareness, then we can keep achieving and keep achieving and we never learn what enough is because you never have enough to make that part of you go away. I broke up with Sue Siebert, not because of how I felt about her. I broke up with her because of how I felt about me. Mm. And you probably heard how you spell intimacy. I N. T-O-M-E-S-E-E. -E. And two. <laughs> we got 7 billion people on the planet, maybe 8 billion. Why do we have so little real intimacy? And I think it has something to do with how we feel about ourselves to risk letting people get close. And it's so sad because we have a limitless capacity for intimacy. If we're aware of that part of us and could be it, loving and accepting of ourselves with our flaws. Also, if we can be loving and accepting of ourselves with our flaws, because how I treat you guys is more about how I feel about me than how I feel about you. When your flaws show up, I'm more likely to be loving and accepting of you regardless of your flaws. Oh, thank you, Bowen. I'm, I'm, I'm so triggered right now to think about how, how do we change this? Like how, how, how can we shift the culture to be willing to accept fear and failure and all these things as good? Well, it's just, it's funny because we, we go from zero to a hundred. We go from a mistake to feeling like we're a failure. <laughs> You know, there's no grayish in between there. We just go one. Oh, that's a reminder of what a schmuck I am. So the idea of I'm, I still got that part of me. I, I'm not going to get rid of that part of me. But sharing the fact that we all have that in common should be a relief. And, mm -hmm. and the idea of being loving and a loving and compassionate person we have to do that with ourselves. We have to do that. And, and it's not it's not a negative thing. And it's maybe it's a good thing that we have this part of us that's there striving to demonstrate competence because we get a lot of stuff done. It's just when the ego is operating at full steam, what we do is going to be operating on the surface of what we're capable of doing together. We have to, friend and mentor of mine, Elmer Green, who was grandfather of biofeedback, we had this conversation about the ego and how it can get in the way. And Elmer said, well, you know, every now and then you got to throw the ego a bone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, I can't pretend I don't have one. I mean, uh, Jung, I heard this story once. Jung heard that there was some guy in India, some holy guy, that got rid of his ego. 
And so he he was in India and he went to visit this guy. He went, whoa, maybe he's pulled it off, you know. And then he met his wife. <laughs> And he, he recognized that, uh, yeah, right, that you can't get rid of that. That's part of us. And the scared one is part of it. But it's important to recognize that's not all of us. What happens if you switch the C and the A? Sacred. Yes. Mm. Can't deny that I have the part of me mm. has those feelings of inadequacy. But there's this other part of me. And it may not be the product of a sperm and an egg. I don't know. But there's something, there's something about human beings. There's something inside us that's mysterious, whereby any of us would give up in a heartbeat our own life for someone we don't even know and have never met. And that sort of thing happens all the time. What is it? There's something inside us that's not simply connected to the ego. I mean, the ego's concern, you know, when we're gone, it's got no place to live. But there's this other part of us, this, this part of us, the, the sacred one. Everybody's, we're in the same boat, regardless of club or fil affiliation. The, the problem is that mysterious part of us that people have a belief system and the driver of that part of us is love. Whereas the driver of the scared one is fear, the driver of the sacred one is love. And if we're aware of that, then, and we have a belief system that's inclusive of there being some mystery, and in that mystery, there's one family, the family of all humanity, then regardless of how we approach our relationship with that mystery, the important question becomes, are we worthy of love and acceptance as we are flaws and all? I mean, is God waiting for the new improved you? I mean, you mean just as we are, we're worthy of love and acceptance? If that's your belief system, what good is the belief system if you don't put it into action? So if we can use our belief of our values, fundamental values, are they connected to this mysterious love that um, has different kinds of manifestation? You know, there's Eros. Well, it's not what we're talking about. This would be agape. You know, this unconditional love. It's the it's the thing that's operating um, when, when the grandparents are taking care of the grandkids in the presence of their own children. And the parents say, of the grandkids say to us as the grandparents, well, you never let us do that when we were kids. And the grandparents say, well, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, <laughs> come here, sweetie. I don't care if you spilled chocolate on your dress. I'll lick it off. You're so radiant. I just love you so much. I'm going to eat your face. You know, that that quality of acceptance and and it's so satisfying to resonate at at that frequency. And we the wonderful thing I think about that is that I don't have to be the generator. I don't have to be the generator. Can you say more about I can, generator? I'll, I I think I think we have the capacity to be open. Um, there's a writer I like a lot, Frederick Beekner. He's written a bunch of different books. I think uh, Wheaton College has all of his works, but he he wrote a book called Wishful Thinking: The ABCs of Theology, and he takes the letters of the alphabet and he writes essays about each letter. So, you know, I'm reading on healing. I mean, I'm in, the, I'm in the club. And he says, imagine yourself as somewhat of a clogged up pipe. Okay. I mean, having feelings of inadequacy, we, we can feel like a little bit of mm -hmm. a clogged up pipe. Yeah. He said, but you're not, we're not totally clogged up. 
just open up to the possibility you can allow something to move through you into the world that you don't have to generate. You can hold in your awareness. Energy follows attention. You only have energy for what you pay attention to. If you can just be present and be open, not having to try to figure out the right thing to do or say, to be present and loving and, you know, that seems to be something we can all do, even though we're somewhat of a clogged up pipe. And the thing is, how do we feel in the process of doing that? When I can remember to actually do that, I like how it feels. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, and yeah. you, you, you've brought forth for me the, and you talked about, you know, the ninth grade story and you talked about, you know, the, the, the family and the relationships there. And then there's that group of people we can spend eight hours a day with five days a week working with. And that same group of people are just like us. They have the same scared mm -hmm. fears, right? A and the creativity that can come from or come f with working with all that and being able to surrender to your fears at the same time, the creativity and the fears of other people to bring that together. And I, I noticed myself doing this years and years ago was, well, there was the home life and then there was that work life and it didn't do that. And then it hit me. I'm the same self there as I am at home. Yeah. So now like, how do we help businesses and, and how do we get groups of people? Like it's, it can be too big for us to, for me to grab, oh, how do we change humanity? Oof, a big one. And then how, how do we do our family? Well, that's good. But then there's like the next group bigger. Like how do we work mm -hmm. with that? How do, how do we get them to hold that we have this story called a, a scared one? Well, that answers Debbie's question. Deb's question, excuse me. I. You're okay. You took me back to like when I was, I don't know, okay. seven or something. That was, that's good. I mean, that that's the wonderful thing about getting to be a leader and, and getting to infect other people and help people grow and mature and develop into what they're capable of being. Not what we're interested in them becoming, but helping them become what they're capable of being in terms of their own, um, their own journey and to honor the fact that getting to participate in that process is, um, well, I think that's, I think it's sacred space. A blessing, if you make it, yeah. If you make it so. And you know, what? one of the things that I recognize, when people came to my office to see me, I got to participate in their lives in a meaningful way. And it's an honor to get to participate in a meaningful way in the lives of other people. Right? I mean, it's so mm -hmm. satisfying. Well, guess what I discovered? Other people like getting to participate in my life in a meaningful way. But in order for that to work, I've got to risk being vulnerable with them. And the scared one's going to get in the way of doing that. So we need people in our circle of support that are gonna be there to help us on our journey because all of us are too close to our own stuff to see with clarity what we're doing all the time. I mean, I use, I use the analogy that, you know, if I, you know, shave or any man shaves and gets his face too close to the mirror, well, what happens if you get your face too close to the mirror when you're shaving, Ron? No, what does what? your own breath do? No, my fog, I fog the mirror up and can't see what I'm doing. Can't, yeah. My, my bias is we're all too close to our own stuff and our own hot air fog, fogs up our ability to see us with clarity. So we need other people in our lives that will hold up a mirror and help us get back on track when, we, when our ego takes over. You know, when we forget what we're here to do, 
you know, we're, we're the people we used to complain about. What are we going <laughs> to do with our turn? We're the parents, we're the grownups, we're the leaders. We are the people we used to complain about. It's our turn. What are we going to do with our turn in our world, in our sphere of influence? And that's something we each got to figure out for ourselves and um, see what we can do to infect other people with a suspiciously healthy contagion. That's, it, you know, you just uh, triggered me to think about, so Ron has developed the Macklin method uh, and a step of the Macklin method is to allow people to contribute to you. And sometimes it's the hardest thing for people to do. Even though when I asked him, I said, how do you feel like when you contribute to someone else? They're like, oh, that's so fantastic. I'm like, oh, do you let people contribute to you? It's like, oh, no, I can do it by myself. I'm like, huh. <laughs> and I always ask, like, why do you rob people of the joy that you get? <laughs> and it's funny. It's funny how that ego, like, oh, no, I can do it all by myself. Um, but how much joy there is in the world in really contributing to others. Yeah. And accepting, accepting. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And sometimes that means accepting something that people have trouble telling us. You know, that's the mirror part. Mm. And if, you know, and I think about that and you think about teachers that you had and think about did the best teachers that you had, did they always tell you what you wanted to hear? Or did you ever have a teacher that thought you were capable of something you didn't know you were capable of? And mm -hmm. because you knew they cared about you and held an expectation that you could achieve, that you could be successful, you were able to learn what you had thought you could not learn. And, and, and I think that's what a key for leaders to know that you, holding the expectation that people can get it, you know, that they're capable of. I mean, look at us. Look at all the mistakes we've made on the, on the road to getting where we are. And we're not done. I mean, when I went to hour and a half appointments with every patient in 1984, I put a big sign on my door. Caution, beware of doc, enter your own risk. I make mistakes every day. You know, as a reminder to myself, the irony is, what do you think a side effect was with patients when they saw the sign? Uh, I speculate they'd be very open to telling you about their own mistakes, about their own errors, their weaknesses, their, their stories yeah. in their head, their fears. The irony is I put it on the door to meet my own needs, for me to remind myself about what's important. And the side effect of honoring our own needs, although growing up to be that concerned with getting your needs met is to be selfish. If we're here to serve the common good and you're neglectful of your needs, you can't honor the common good because we're all part of the common good. So we need to own our neediness. Mm -hmm. And I put it on the door. And so there, that lowered the bar for them to be able to risk being vulnerable with me. And I didn't think about that when I put the sign on the door, you know? So we're not done making mistakes. And it's, it's how we learn. If you're interested in growing, maturing, and developing throughout the life cycle, which we're meant to do, we're meant to grow young, not old. We're meant to stay in a developmental process our whole lives, continue to learn. It means we're going to continue to make mistakes. And if I'm okay with that, I've taken the negative charge off it, then I'm more open to hearing feedback that I need to hear to help me get better at what I do. And Ron, and you, Deb, and myself, and everyone else is an underachiever in terms of what we're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. We just can't get better alone. And we can't get better without making mistakes. We need each other. <laughs> Tiger Woods, best golfer ever. Guess what he had? 
He had a coach. Coaches. Still the, and you know what? The coach wasn't as good as he was. It's a pretty important thing for a leader to remember. <laughs> yep. It, yep. <laughs> uh, a great leader will have people working for them that will outperform the leader. Yeah. Yeah. Because leading is a different skill than performing. And yes, I accept. Yeah. It, Ain't it great? You don't have to have all the answers. It's it's really funny that I talk to so many people who talk about perfectionism. Like, oh, I'm a perfectionist. Mm. And isn't isn't it interesting like that we we need to make mistakes to fail. So if you're a perfectionist, like how can you move in the world with others when you've stated Yep, that's the way I'm going to be. I'm going to do everything to perfection. It it seems like it's a really closed space. Yeah. I think so. And unattainable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for uh, <laughs> just how you, how you uh, may be curious to think about. Sorry, Deb. So, it looked like you had a question, so I was, I was giving you space. Well, I, I think about how this leads to like believing in others, like really believing in others. Um, and you see companies that they hire people that look a lot like them, that act a lot like them, have the same degrees as them. But this idea of allowing for mistakes opens up a whole new space to bring people in that aren't like you and believe in them that they have the abilities to learn and I'm it, I'm just really curious how we can bring that forth even more in the world is how do you believe in others more risk risk being vulnerable yourself mm -hmm. that's I, I the only you want to create a safe environment for learning the final common pathway of learning is mistake making and, you know, it's ironic. You could ask a whole group of people, what's the final common pathway of learning? And they'll say everything else but mistake making. <laughs> and so the leader being vulnerable creates a safe environment for people to ask for what they need, to risk saying what they need in the way of support, to help them do what they're capable of doing. And the leader has to meet them where they are to help them get to where they need to be. That means you have to know what's going on with that person as a person, not simply as a producer. And knowing the story, you, the story in your head, you need to know the story in a sense in their head. You need to know that whatever it is, it's incredibly logical in the context of that person's development. I, I use the analogy of a movie because it, it just, you, well, you like stories, Ron. I like stories. I love going to the movies. Okay, so let's say we're going to do um, a field trip and we're going to go to a movie and we go to a movie that we want to see and we go in and we sit down and and we think we're watching previews of coming attractions, but we're actually in the wrong theater. But we're early for the movie we came to see, so we think, oh, I'll just watch a little bit of this. And you see this little snippet out of the middle of a movie, and you see this character with this obvious character flaw, and you go, what a schmuck, and you have no sympathy or compassion for that schmuck, and then it's time to go see the movie you came to see. And then two weeks later, you go back and you see the movie you saw the snippet of. And seeing it from the beginning to the place in the movie that you saw before, you see the exquisite logic of the flaw, mm. that they could not be different than they are. In fact, they're doing the best job with their lives with the information they got about how to do grown up. So it immediately changes the charge, the vibe that you experience in terms of that person and can connect in a way that's instructive as a metaphor for when we see the flaw in the other or the thing in the other that's getting in the way. 
there must be some logic behind that being there. And to, to recognize you don't have to know exactly what it is, but that allows you to just remind you that well, they're doing the best job they can with the information, but we all got some misinformation. Mm-hmm. We, you know, I went, uh, go ahead. I'm, uh, no, thanks, Bowen. Uh, what's showing up for me is we basically see the previews for everybody else's life, but it's not the one that makes them look the best. That's it's, right. It, it's just a preview. And, and that's all we have to go by. <laughs> and unless we have a stand that says everybody's doing the best they can with what they got, right? They're all afraid. And they're, they're doing their best to use your term. To, to be grown up or to, what do you call it? To act grown to up? To do grown up. To do, do, yeah. Yeah, to do grown up, right? <laughs> right? Because because we most people we meet, we all we get is that 30 second preview. Sure. A- and it's never going to be their best. It's always going to be random. Mm-hmm. And it's up to our stand on how we see them. What stories we have in our head that no matter what they're doing, we can be centered on what we hold in their head is they're doing the best they can. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. I think this is great for uh, personal relationships, families, businesses, groups, mm-hmm. work, going to the grocery store, right? Whatever it is you're doing, if there's another human there, that's a great stand to be in. Yeah. Everybody's doing the best they can. Just like us. Just like us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We think we have nothing in common with other people. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I went <laughs> in '89. I went to uh, the first international holistic medicine conference in India, and the first speaker was the Dalai Lama which was a real treat. And I was, I sat in the front row and it wasn't a big meeting. Um, but I took a, a press credential to be able to have some time with the Dalai Lama to do an interview. And, you know, th- that's kind of a another thing. They're driving into the hotel where this place was, the conference was, it's lined with people, lined with people to get a glimpse of the Dalai Lama, you know, long drive. And what he said in 25 minutes made me know I didn't need a special time with him. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of other people that I, you know, I was fed. And he, he said, some things I think that are really useful to continue to remember. He said, I don't know why I'm talking at a medical meeting. He said, I don't know anything about medicine, not a doctor. I do know sometimes I get sick. I go to see a doctor, you know, many degrees on the wall. If I don't feel any warmth coming from him to me, it doesn't matter what medicine he gives me. I don't feel so good. Mm. But sometimes I get sick, I go to see the doctor. I feel warmth coming from him to me. Doesn't matter what medicine he gives me, I feel better. <laughs> he said, I don't know why I'm here to med- speak in a medical meeting. I don't know anything about medicine. He said, but when you look at the world situation today, and I think he had recently won the World Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, or, you know, if you look at the world situation, what's required today uh, is love and compassion. Religion is a luxury. What's required is love and compassion. Interesting from the head of a religion. So he spoke. And then another 101-year-old Lama got up to speak. And here's what he said. We are radiant beings. Enlightenment is about discovering that and sat down. (laughs) 
and 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 I I I you know I'm father of four daughters when they were born you know I took after they were born they went to their mother's breast and then I took them to a warm water bath in the birthing room and gave them a massage and welcomed them to the world and told them how much we already loved them and and just generally slobbered on them you know when these radiant beings come through us into the world that's sacred space and you know what the lama said we are radiant beings but we don't feel radiant i mean when people get up in the morning you wake up in the morning you go in the bathroom you look in the mirror and you go wow where did that come from it wasn't that big <laughs> yesterday was <it? laughs> You know, you go, geez, you look for the flaw and what do you find? The hmm. flaw. Yeah. I mean, in spite of the flaws, we're still radiant beings, but we don't feel so radiant. But you do radiate. What you do in the world with your being, you, you can't help it, whether you like it or not. You're emanating there's some vibe that's coming off you into the world. And, and the irony is somebody could meet you, Deb. And, and they go, she is so bright. She is so on top of it. She is so together. I, I mean, it's, she's so wonderful. And then they can use your wonderful wonderfulness in, by comparison to feel like they don't measure up, that they're not enough. Mm, mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, we don't just project our shadow on other people. We project our light on other people. It's, you can't see the light in another person if you don't carry it. And everyone, you, you see what you look for. <laughs> Focus on the flaw, you see the flaw. Focus at the light that's in there. Just might see it. You'll find the light. Pardon me? You'll find the light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what I'm taking for myself is that means when I wake up I have a story that I'm looking for the light. In and you. In me. And I'm looking for the light in others. Mm-hmm. To be a at choice in this space. Oh, say more about that. Like at choice. Well, like, there's a way to get up in the morning. There's a way to go through things where I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get out of it. I'll get done. This will be over with. Or it's a space of like, no, I'm going to. I'm going to choose to be here. I'm going to choose to uh, look for the strengths, the, the 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 gifts, the the light. I'm going to look for. I'm choosing that. Right and choosing my partner, choosing my space, to be a choice around that versus getting up and drifting with whatever news or whatever you read or whatever's around you or uh, just that reflection in the mirror. Uh, but in that space to be a choice of saying, and this is what I'm going to do. This is who I'm going to be. You radiant being. Get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, you radiant being. being. <laughs> yeah. And your wife is in the other room. Ron? <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Do we need to go somewhere now? <laughs> and You know, it's funny. I, uh, she, uh, and she may become like that with me. Yeah, it, it, in the, I write about someone that had a big impact on me named Evie McDonald, who was a nurse. Um, once, so I was involved with the American Holistic Medical Association. I was actually involved as a founding member as a student, medical student in 1978. And continued to be involved with this new medical organization where I found other lunatics like myself that were interested in um, 
treating the whole person and also had a belief system that the maybe the greatest untapped resource in healthcare is inside the patient which is my bias and evie mcdonald did a workshop with our board and evie mcdonald was a nurse and uh, worked in a intensive care unit with other suffering people and um, ended up getting ill and ended up in an intensive care unit herself. Um, and was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and told she had six months to live. And so her story was, um, she was in a wheelchair and she decided if I've only got six months to live, I want to make them the best six that I ever had. How am I going to make them the best six? And every day she would wheel her wheelchair up to the mirror and she looked at herself in the mirror, naked in the mirror. And she saw all the flaws, all the flaws. And she worked through that process to eventually be loving and accepting of the person that was looking back at her in the mirror. And when that happened, she decided that the best thing to do with the six months that I have is to be loving and accepting of everybody I meet, in spite of their flaws. And she had her best six, and then another six, and then another six, and another six, and another six, and Evie McDonald still with us. And that ability to get to that place. Why wait for cancer? Why wait till your kid gets sick? Why wait till the marriage is on the rocks? Why wait? You know, what can you do to be loving and accept? I mean, the but you know, Dalai Lama said it. <laughs> What's required in the world is love and, and compassion. And love and acceptance, you know, this is, this is, we're, we can choose, we can choose. Mm -hmm. But, you know, remember what Virginia Satir said, when we think we have no choice but to do X, check out how you're feeling about yourself. Who's running the engine of your psyche? Which one, your scared guy, your scared gal, or your, that other part of you, that mysterious part of you? It has a, we have a capacity to be fearful and we have a capacity to be loving. And sometimes when we don't like how we're feeling, what, who's, who's, a, who's in the driver's seat of the psyche? <laughs> it's a great noticing to, when we're in that space, when we're not feeling enough, we're not being that, just to notice who's driving here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just to notice that that makes the world a difference. Huh? So, um, Bowen, did you have any other questions? I was going to jump to the end. Yeah. Yeah, I'm this, great. This is kind of our fun part of the conversation. We get a chance. Oh, I always to... wanted to have fun. The whole the whole part of it was fun. So yeah. I'm gonna. Okay, so maybe we should say lighter. I think we we'll okay. go lighter. <laughs> what is your favorite movie, and why? Oh, jeez. Well, there's so many. Mary Poppins is hard to beat. Um, of course, I've had a crush on Julie Andrews forever. Um, you know, I love the, just so many movies. I love, you know, going way, uh, an old movie. I love Humphrey Bogart. You know, and uh, 
you know, he's in Morocco and he's got, you know, it's World War, it's still World War II. And the, the people that are supporting the wrong side are trying to get him to um, reveal secrets that he refuses to. And he ends up at that really risking his own life to save a guy that was trying to help suffering people suffering under uh, the Nazis. And I, I, I love that movie. And I love them him walking off with the, the former police guy, the airplane takes off taking, you know, the, this wonderful humanitarian off with his wife a woman that he loved, that Humphrey Bogart's character loved, that he knew the right thing to do. He did the right thing. I, that's, I love that movie. I love Willy Wonka and the F Chocolate Factory. <laughs> I, I love, I, the I love both of those. Budapest, Grand Budapest Hotel. So, that's one of my favorites. But yeah. With so like many. I I tie in Moonlight Kingdom is one of the best. Oh sure. Yep. Sure. Yeah, it's that's a great show. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. a hoot. He, Wes he is Anderson. A hoot. Yeah. Deb, what's your favorite movie for today? The Princess Bride has always been my favorite movie since I saw it. And that story of true love. Right? Is like that's what persevered throughout the whole thing. And even uh, you know, even when Wesley is fighting the giant, or I'm sorry, the Dread Pirate Roberts is fighting the giant, right? Like, they could be friends about it, <laughs> you know? Uh, when he was working with the everybody, they could they could be peaceful and civilized, even though they were supposed to be at war with each other, and he was supposed to be a bad person. Um, but it's really that story of, like, true love brought everything through. Um, and that happens to be my husband's favorite movie too. So when it comes on, we cannot, Whoa. we have to stop and yeah. watch it for the yeah. 10,000th time. <laughs> yeah. How well, about I, you, Ron? I, I can relate. Thanks. Um, because we've covered Mary Poppins already and Princess Bride, which are both great movies, uh, up in my top 10. But the one I would say is number one is Shawshank Redemption. Oh, you know, I was thinking about that when you said, your husband and you, whenever Shawshank Redemption comes on, we got to watch it. We got to watch it. And there's there's a space of love between the men and, inside there. It's not a it's not a romantic love. It's it's purely a that they accept each other who they are and who they are not. A and they learn and they grow and they become something inside there. And the the trust that's built between them is just phenomenal. Right? And I think it's a wonderful... Um, example of love and acceptance yeah i wish it would keep going when he gets there <laughs> he sees him there the i wanted it to keep going why are you stopping it now <laughs> right let's, let's let's build a boat a hotel let's move on yeah. let's get it going right <laughs> well, thank you so uh bowen like i don't want to i don't want to step over this 27 years ago, you said something and you were, I, I fully hold you were being yourself. You were up in front of the room, you were being yourself, you were doing what you do. And that story has stuck with me and changed my life. So for that, I say thank you for being you. And thank mm -hmm. you for being on our podcast today and the difference that you've made in the world. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one. So with that, I say thank you. And thank I want you. to thank you too. And but I I'm curious because you have a book. <laughs> you have a book out. Oh yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about that book uh, so that other people can look it up and see what's see what you're doing? Well, the book is called Why Normal Isn't Healthy. I am a recovering normal person. I <laughs> used to be normal. Now I'm out of the closet. And it's uh, why normal isn't healthy, how to find heart, meaning, passion, and humor on the road most traveled. 
Um, and the whole idea, the things that I've been talking about are all part of the book. Um, I wrote the book because I would go and speak places and people would say, well, I wish my husband were here and my boss were here or my kid was here, or, you know, so. So I wrote the book um, because of that. And the idea was why wait for the life stopping trauma to take a look at your life, to take a look at the first reel of your life. I, I use the model that life is a movie. Now movies are all in one reel because of digital stuff. But when I was a kid growing up, there were two reels to the movie. The first reel, then you had intermission. And then after intermission was the second reel of the movie. And intermission is when you got your popcorn, candy, pop, you know, whatever, jujubes, juicy fruits, you know, slow pokes, um, <laughs> you know. And, and so I used the metaphor that life's a movie. The first reel of the movie begins when we're born. And the that is you know we're giving a script we're giving direction and we act out our life in the first reel r-e-e-l of the movie and in my practice i saw people at the intermission of their lives because they had their they had an excuse to come see me because they had a world stopping event and that's when I decided to do these hour and a half visits with every patient. And the idea at intermission is, you know, you can look back over the first reel of your life and see how you got to be where you are as a grown up. And you may now be a grown up with cancer. So having take, I would take people through that their life until they came to see me. I would ask all the questions so I could see the first reel of their movie. And we could connect the dots and see the logic of them being exactly the person they are. Now, that's the one that they, you know, were acting out the life. They were given a script, they were given direction, their producers were their parents. And now, in intermission, the work becomes, what do you want to keep doing that you've been doing? What do you want to stop doing that you've been doing? What's most important to you? And what do you want to try again? You may have failed at. You know, you now, because your world has stopped, the status quo of your life is broken. You get to create a status novus, a new, a new you get to write your own script. You're not meant to be an extra in everyone else's film. Okay. We're all star stuff. Nobody is meant to be just an extra in everybody else's film. Everybody has their own story in their head. Everybody has, mm -hmm. we're all star stuff. We actually are star stuff. What is, makes us up. We are star stuff, but we don't feel like it. Second reel of the movie, what you Notice is what's more important gets more attention. What's urgent gets less attention. <laughs> what's most important to people are their relationships. Everything gets done to relate through relationships, how we lead, serve, parent, sell, parent, I, I mean, mentor, coach, everything gets done through relationships. So we need to start with relationship with self. And letting people see the logic. I gather people together at the beginning of the book talking about stress and how we all are born dependent and taught to be codependent. Codependency is a reference to the fact that we're externally referenced. Um, the alcoholic parent comes in the front door. Everybody else is externally focused on dad if he happens to be the alcoholic because his mood drove the mood of the rest of the family. So one person's dependent, the rest of the family's codependent. But the fact is, all animals are codependent. All animals are externally referenced. We needed to be externally referenced to be able to evolve into human beings, to be able to survive threats from the environment. But we learn to be externally referenced and internally neglectful in the first reel of the movie, 
In fact, that's when we learn to be that concerned with getting your own needs met is to be selfish. Hmm. So we move from being outer directed and internally neglectful to coming inside our own hearts and find discovering what is most important to us and allowing what's in our own hearts to be the driver of our behavior on the world stage. So the trajectory of one's life moves from outside in to inside out. And what that means is that when you no longer give away power and control to allow others to drive your behavior and mood, other people may wonder what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you, you need to have support on your journey to risk living a life out of your own center. And, and, and that means you would need other people to travel with. I mean, Rumi is, I have a lot of Rumi poetry in the book. Coleman Barks happens to be a translator of Rumi poetry, and he happens to be a friend that I met along the road, and this is an amazing job. People could just not read Why Normal Isn't Healthy. They could just read Rumi poetry and would probably get more than they would out of my book. But Rumi, one of his poems is, if you are separated from those in spiritual labor, you are thrown down. You are a part without its whole. And if the enemy of ecstasy finds anyone cut off from that whole, he experiences him all alone and eats him up. We need other people on our journey. And this is a spiritual journey in a sense, because it's not necessarily um, in keeping with secular values. And the way we learn to be in the world, it's, it's recognizing that we need to be in the world, but being in a, a different way that has heart, meaning, and passion for us. And even if other people want, wonder what's wrong with us, we're able to do the right thing. And we need other people that are going to support us doing the right thing because other people are not going to buy what we're selling. So, so having that uh, community of people that you're on this journey with, I think is hugely important. That means keeping your, um, again, energy follows attention on your, in your relational horizon, look for other lunatics. People that are suspiciously healthy and say, you know, Deb, uh, I'd kind of like to take you to coffee because I think there's something going on with you that I'd like to get some more of. And if you don't mind, could I have a cup of coffee with you? Would you fit me into your busy schedule? You know, we there are people out there that are as crazy as you two. And, you know, it's an, I call it a nut working thing, you know, nut working. You have to find <laughs> other nuts that, that, you know, are a little askew and, uh, you know, that may, there's something going on with them you want to get next to. And, and so the book is, you, there's, there's a lot in the book that, I, you know, when I recognized um, that I didn't know anything at the age of 23 and a college graduate with the military stuff behind me um, and was doing this adventure that I'd been thinking of doing for four years, which is to go see some of the world that I hadn't seen and which meant going abroad. Um, I was in Morocco and one month into my journey for that one, one month, I had um, been doing things and I thought, boy, it'll be really fun to share this with Ron. <laughs> if I tell him about this, you know, that would really be cool. And I wasn't really present 
where I was, I was doing stuff that I thought would really be something that would be cool to share with other people. And, and I, I was depressed and I thought, okay, I'm on my big adventure. You know, what's the problem? Why would I be depressed? I'm in Marrakesh. And then I thought different language, food, religion, culture, everything I knew was back home. I knew what other people said they knew, but what did I know for sure? And I had that, that Socratic moment. I didn't know anything. I knew what other people said they knew. I didn't. What did I know? And that, that, was, that was a bottom. And that bottom, you know, I left in December of 69, so this would be January of 70. That bottom, I thought, okay, if I don't know anything, that's a, that's a good, firm foundation. If I don't know anything, then anybody could teach me something. But I won't believe what they say without testing it to see if it's true for me. And I'll build my house of self experiential brick by experiential brick being open to what's happening in the world where I am right now and take it in and test what they say to see if it's true for me. So there's a lot in the book, some of which um, I've been thinking about since then. <laughs> and that's why I say when I'm speaking, do not believe anything I say. It might be wrong. Remember the sign of my door. Caution, beware of doc. Enter your own <laughs> rift. I make mistakes every day. Believe nothing without testing. And I give my disclaimer everywhere I speak because it's true. It might be a mistake. Test it. See if it's true for you. And the things that I've talked about in this time that we've had together. One thing that we really haven't touched on is the definition of health that I use, which is the ability to work, to love, to play, and to think soundly. And I stole it from the guy that wrote Growing Young, Ashley Montague, a cultural anthropologist. And he's the one that taught me about neoteny. Neoteny is a word that means for physical anthropologists, the retention of immature physical characters into adulthood. And if you see, and in the book, I show a picture of an immature chimpanzee and looks like a little kid with a flat face, you know, and extra hair. And then next to that is a picture of an adult chimpanzee and this large mandible juts out forward because the flat faces of the child is gone because the chimpanzee doesn't retain the immature physical character into adulthood. So that's, and, and Neoteny is also connected to our very long period of childhood, longer than, you know, any, any other critter. So this physical anthrop, this cultural anthropologist took that idea and he said, well, the evolutionary intelligence is trying to tell us something about Neoteny. And that is that what we're supposed to be doing is to retain the immature behavioral characteristics of the child throughout development. Plasticity, authenticity, playfulness, curiosity, that we're supposed to stay in touch with those wonderful traits of the child throughout the life cycle and to stay in a developmental process our whole lives. Whereas most people slip into a box long before they're dead they learn how to compensate for their feelings of inadequacy. They've done their important grown-up learning. They're making money. They put money aside for retirement. They save money maybe for kids to go to college. And, and they just keep repeating behavior sets that they've already learned. And they grow old. But what he's saying, we're meant to grow young. And the definition, the ability to work, to love, to play, and to think soundly I think is pretty interesting. I like that because that means someone can be healthy if they have cancer. 
or if they have heart disease, or if they have yep. diabetes, or if they have mental illness, the ability to work, to love, to play, and to think soundly. But it's hard to be healthy, to think healthy, if you're scared one's doing the thinking. It's hard to do the loving if the scared one is doing the loving. Makes it's up. hard to do really great work, you know, if the scared one is doing the work, you get burned out because it'll never be enough. And the scared one has a little problem being playful. <laughs> you know, because, you know, being a grown up is really serious. Four year old laughs 40 times a day, 40 year old, four, maybe, I don't know, some numbers. So, that part, what I have not talked about is the importance of being playful. And being playful means that you take the golden rule and you turn it to, you turn it around. Do unto others what they, what they would have you do unto them. You know, um, some people call that the platinum rule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, being playful means being present in the moment, being open to all the possibilities of the moment, um, carrying a, a, a uh, idea of fairness. If it's not fair, it's not play in terms of original play. I'm not talking about the kind of play we grew up learning how to do. Yeah, our kids need to know how to compete for Pete's sakes. You know, it's a dog eat dog world, isn't it? You know, have either of you ever seen a dog eating another dog? I know, I've never seen the dog eating another dog thing. Um, but that's the kind of play we learn how to do. It's part of normal not being healthy. In order to feel good, we got to beat somebody else. But this other kind of play is a, a play where you're trying to make the thing that feels good last as long as possible. Like the play that two kids, one's a little older and stronger than the other, and they're playing together. And without being taught, the older child will handicap him or herself in their playing together because if he or she expressed all of their competence in their playing together, play would end. So they handicap themselves to make the thing that feels good last as long as possible. So that's the quality of play that I think is connected to that mysterious, that mysterious part of us. That, that I think it's connected to um, our spirituality. Being present, being open, being fair, and wanting the thing that you're doing to be mutually enjoyable. Enjoyable. To make it last as long. Make it last as long as possible. I love and that play. Thing is, it's one of the things we don't have to be taught how to do. We learn how to do original play without being taught. So I end the book talking about play. And there's a, it's tied in also, you know, the, the movies Tuesday with Maury, mm -hmm. the book, the book, the Tuesdays, book. I Tuesdays think, with Maury. I think yep. it's a, maybe a movie too. I don't know, but there's a book Tuesday with Maury and this guy's got ALS and his student finds out Ted Koppel show late at night. He sees his former professor Maury has ALS. So he goes to visit Maury because, you know, he's dying of ALS. And he has, this guy meant so much to him. He was his pr important professor. And then once a week, he keeps going back. And at the end of the life, at the end of, you know, it's close to dying. And, and Maury says, if you, if you could go back the, and be the way you were, before you got ALS, would you want to do it? And you know what he says? He says, no, I, I, I wouldn't. Because it's, it's made me look at 
what's most important in life. And it's funny, I, I saw the four things he talked about and the four things that Ashley Montague talked about in his definition of health, they match up really well. And play ends up matching up with spirituality. Mm. Mm. <laughs> the other three, it seems really clear. This other one, people may not get. And, you know, we get to choose how to be in the world. And even in business, you know, people take their money very seriously. Guess what? People also take their money very personally and they give it very personally. So you want to be the kind of person people want to give their, give their money to. And that's someone that's fair. And the content, you know, everything, it's just money. You know, it's not the most important thing. The relationship is the most important thing. And what kind of business? Everybody's got products and services that are pretty much the same. Who do you want to give your money to? Someone you like being around? And someone that's light and buoyant, playful? I'd rather give my money to them. You know, because it's more fun being around them. And I like having fun. <laughs> I always me, wanted to. I'm going to start. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Well, thank you, Bowen, for being on our podcast today. Uh, thank you, Deb, as always. And uh, really thankful that we've had this time. I thank Man. you. You're to blame for this. And <laughs> you gave me such a gift when I saw your message to me from... I think it was March of 19, uh, um, no, it was 2018. And you said, I, I, I just, so this is a month ago, maybe, huh? Yes. I, I'm in France. And you, you send this message, you know, you spoke to this executive MBA class and, you know, you said what you said and in your thing and, I, and wanted to have a virtual coffee. And I wrote back and I said, you know, we both in Overland Park, it doesn't have to be virtual, let's meet in person. And by the way, if I weren't already visiting my daughter in France, your message on LinkedIn would have made my day. But visiting my daughter in France and your message, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm good in second place. <laughs> <laughs> and grandkids. Yes. Know. So... Five years later, I see the message. And that's instructive, folks. Think about this. You have no idea the impact you have in the world. Don't wait to feel good till you get a message from Ron. You're supposed to let it go and <laughs> on to the next person. Very good. Thank you, Bowen. Thank you, Deb. And Thank you. Bowen, Thank you. Nice to meet you, Deb. Nice to meet you, too.